Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. I don't know about you, but I find it hard to be consistently productive. It seems like it's a secret weapon for some and a natural gift for others. My guest today, Dermot Crowley, is the director and founder of Adapt Productivity, a Sydney-based training company founded almost two decades ago. He's one of Australia's foremost thought leaders on productivity. He's the author of Smart Work and the founder of Adapt Productivity. Building on many years of experience in the productivity training industry, he created ADAPT in 2002 with a vision of helping management and staff in Australia's leading organisations to manage their time, priorities and emails more effectively using tools like MS Outlook and mobile technology. He's a highly inspiring yet practical in his approach to productivity in the modern workplace. And Dermot's passion is in creating real behavioural change and he's developed a system for working productively that is applicable to anyone working in today's busy email-driven workplaces. While remaining heavily involved in the training activities of the business, much of Dermot's time is spent working with senior leaders and leadership teams on their productivity and their ability to lead productivity in their own teams. His pragmatic approach and wealth of experience ensure that he brings relevant strategies to the table for the leadership level. His focus on productivity technology ensures that executives are getting the most from their tools at their fingertips. And it's with great pleasure I welcome him to the politics of everything. Hi, Dermot. Hi, Amber. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm guessing that as a kid, you obviously the world of productivity wouldn't have been something that uh, would have come to mind. I mean, did you want to be an astronaut or something wildly different to what you're doing today? How was your early career journey formed? Yeah, look, I, I must say, no, productivity um, was not on my radar screen. And in fact, I was a completely disorganized mess until I started working in this space. But when I was a kid, I grew up in Dublin in Ireland, and I wanted to be a graphic artist. I had a very, very specific yearning to be able to draw things like cartoons and, you know, graphic art. Anything that I could copy, I I would copy. I I love that. But unfortunately, uh, I didn't have the the work ethic back then to practice as much as I I should have to become a, a good artist. And um, I, I always, I, I, I think I hated my father for a while when he forced me to do French instead of art at school because I thought I was going to be a great artist, but he knew that I wasn't particularly serious about it. So I, I got sent along another track, unfortunately. And did you end up studying something after school and, and that led you to a more corporate career or where did that land you next? Yeah, look, I, I think I had a very uh, interesting pathway. I didn't do well at school. Uh, I was a very intelligent kid. But school didn't really work for me in some ways, and and, uh, I struggled, so I um, never went to university. I actually left school and and started sweeping floors in a supermarket, and I have to say it was the the best pathway that I could have had because I learned to work hard. And that was kind of what was missing in my my schooling. I I learned to work hard and it eventually led me to come to Australia when I was in my mid-twenties. And I had this fierce work ethic, which I think stood me in good stead and and led to me starting my own business. So what is your definition of productivity in business and even in a broader sense? I mean, we think about things like time management, having those big and small goals broken down so you kind of get there a little bit every day or is it something else that kind of in your world in your experience has defined productivity for you and your clients yeah look I had a, a really interesting conversation with a um, a new client just uh, probably two months ago where they were wanting to roll out a whole bunch of training to their team and they specifically asked me not to call it productivity training and I kind of spent the last 20 years positioning myself as a productivity expert 
And I kind of scratched my head and I thought, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. And then I, I asked them why. I, got, I really wanted to understand what their particular direction was. And I realized that their definition of productivity was different to mine. So they, they kind of said to me, look, we don't want to call it productivity training because we don't want our people to feel like we're just trying to get more out of them. And then I realized that the way I position what I do is, is quite different. So sure, productivity is about quantity. It's about getting more done. But it's also about the quality of the work. It's about being efficient, so getting things done with the least amount of effort or friction. And it's about effectiveness. It's about helping people to make sure they're doing the right stuff. And it's about balance. It's about helping people to get it done without killing themselves. And, and that, for me, is a much more holistic definition of productivity. So when I go into an organization, that's the way I'm framing it rather than just you know, getting more done. So that leads, I guess, to my next question. And with the clients, particularly, obviously, the big end of town, but probably some smaller businesses too, do you find that productivity traditionally is measured by, you know, output and profit shares and balance sheets and those sorts of things? And and I guess, how can we think of it differently? Is there any examples where we can kind of, you know, shift the way we think about productivity traditionally, particularly if we've come from that corporate background? And I guess... Mm. Is behavioural change part of that? I mean, how does that fit into the mix? Yeah, absolutely. So, look, productivity is a word that gets used at at different levels. So, you know, governments will talk about productivity, you know, with a a much more macro perspective than, I guess, what I'm talking about. I'm really talking about personal and and team productivity. It's quite quite a different thing. My experience, and most most of my clients would be the bigger end of town, but I, I deal with lots of businesses, big and small, and, and in many different industries. I tend to find that productivity isn't necessarily measured, or it's maybe not that easy to measure um, when it comes to the, the, the sort of personal productivity that I deal with. Uh, quite often, people will come to me because a need has been identified uh, through some sort of a training needs analysis. And, be, and it's usually, you know, people are struggling, people are drowning in emails, people are just spending too much of their time in meetings, people are overly stressed. So they're the indicators that some productivity training might be useful. But then I find, you know, we, we often run training and it's not particularly measured. So there aren't uh, necessarily you know, economic factors or financial factors or profitability factors that are directly linked back to people's productivity. But I, I think that there's a general sense that people are coping better. People feel that they're they're more on top of their workload. And usually managers can see that people are getting they are getting more done and hopefully in a more balanced way. And so it's it's more anecdotal than it is measured in my experience. And that behavioural change piece, I mean, you, you talk about that being something that is important in, in your practice. What does that really mean? Look, that for me, it's, it's, it, it's everything. It's, it, there's, no point, there's no point talking to people about um, productivity systems unless we create a, a behavioural change. And it needs to be a sustained behavioural change. So, you know, when we, we talk to people about how they manage their schedules and their priorities... We talk to people about how they manage things like email, incoming work. We talk to people about how they focus on what's really important and has impact in their role. And the the challenge is often the fact that we're, we're battling against some very ingrained habits that people tend to have. So most people are very expert in what they do, but when it comes to how they work, Usually, that's something that they've cobbled together over, you know, sometimes many years. And then we come along and we're usually recommending different disciplines that kind of fly in the face of their existing habits. And that can be really challenging. So, you know, a part of our job is to help shift the mindset and get people to embrace some new thinking and and some new habits and then to practice those habits over a period of time. I would generally say that people need to be really disciplined about practicing the new habits for at least a month, but ideally three months to to really become masterful at those new habits, and, and then they don't have to think about it so much. 
I guess it's like any new habit. There is a period of transition, isn't there, between you know, the old habit, putting that in a box, and then I guess you know, whether it be exercise and other things in our lives, you know, then it just becomes part of the day-to-day. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think, um, unfortunately, a mistake that people often make is, is they give up too soon. So I reckon that when we need to put in the most effort and work when we're trying to change a habit um, is probably in that kind of, you know, one to six week mark. But often the real productivity gains don't kick in until a bit later. So people give up when it's hard, but they haven't seen the benefits yet. And, uh, you know, I think one of my key messages to people is keep going, keep practicing, because you will find that suddenly it just gets easier and you don't have to think about it so much because that new habit has kicked in and then you really see the benefits. So productivity, in my mind, is a bit like culture in a business. That tone is set from the top of the organisation, the leadership team or the executives in play. How can we ensure that they teach and embrace productivity but also reward those in their team who actually follow suit? Mm, what's in it, what's in it for everybody, I guess, is the yeah, question. Yeah. You're totally right. For me, productivity is, is a, it's a personal issue. So it's about personal productivity, your own set of habits and, and systems, if you like. But it's also cultural. And um, this, this is the reason why I've written a, a few books on productivity. My, my first one was Smart Work, which is all about that personal productivity piece. But a couple of years later, I wrote a second book called Smart Teams. And, and that's all about productivity cultures. And I guess my frustration was that I was training a lot of people uh, around personal productivity and people loved it and they go back to their workplaces and they'd be so excited about how this is going to change their life. But unfortunately, they often went back into a culture that just killed their productivity all over again. And I really realized that in order to create that long-term productivity gain in an organization, we needed to both attack the personal productivity skills as well as the um, the productivity cultures. And I believe that there are probably four cultures that most businesses need to focus on. There's your communication or your email culture. And, and you know, lots of the business I'm working with, you know, people are getting at least 100 emails a day, if not two or 300 emails a day, which is just absolutely impossible to stay on top of. There's your meeting culture. And again, I'm working with people who are just spending all day, every day in back-to-back meetings. And they might be virtual and online now, but they're still back-to-back. There's your collaboration culture. And then finally, there's your urgency culture. So I work in a lot of businesses where everything is urgent and and everyone is just reacting constantly to the latest urgent issue that uh, has come up. So I kind of believe that leaders need to really step up and and put productivity on the agenda, see it as a part of their role to to, uh, create cultural shifts around these things, and then to, you know, put projects in place that do shift the behaviors of the team. And my belief is that culture is just a set of group behaviors. And if you can consistently change the behaviors of the group, then your culture will shift and you'll, you'll create a new norm for everyone who works in that team or that business. I have a more technological question for you now. We've sort of looked at the people side of things, but I guess you touched on a little bit talking about meetings with people and I guess emails are the second one, that sort of, you know, vampire of productivity along with all those other channels. Like I think in the past 18 months since we've been working remotely more often, it's amazing. Like I now have to use Slack, four different types of video call platforms, all those text things which are meant to make us more maybe accessible, that we, you know, we can build the culture still, we can answer questions quickly without another meeting. But I think sometimes when I have them all open at once, it can make me feel like my days are much longer and not necessarily looking back, can I say I've achieved more? I've just maybe felt like I've got to communicate more, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, How can people manage that? Because it is not just about MS Outlook now and our mobile phone. There's so much more that we have to use. Yeah, I see it as a big issue, it's, you know, especially um, over the last 12, 18 months where it has shifted to, you know, a lot of people working in more remote locations. And we have to be much more self-managed and self-driven. And technology is a part of the, the solution. So, you know, with a lot of my clients, they are using Microsoft-centric tools 
And one of the tools that has really come to the fore is Microsoft Teams as a collaboration platform. Now, there's other businesses that might be using Slack or, you know, there's any number of these platforms. But whatever the platform, the, the issue that it's created is people have too many different places to look when they're trying to work out what they need to do. And it's becoming very confusing and when it comes to communication. You know, the question is, do we send an email? Do we put a message on Slack or on Microsoft Teams? Do we send them a WhatsApp message? Do we have a meeting? Do we just pick up the phone and have a conversation? And there aren't a lot of guidelines in organizations around what's the right tool to use in the right situation. So that's certainly a part of the conversation that I have now with clients to try and help them to work out, well, when is it most effective to use email? And when is it most effective to use a collaboration platform like Slack or Microsoft Teams? And then how can we wrap some good productivity agreements around how we use these tools to make sure that we're not creating productivity friction, we're creating productivity flow for everyone involved. Yeah, and I think that's the dilemma I've had. And, you know, without naming names, I've had clients of like, oh, but I uploaded the proposal to Slack. And I'm thinking, but wouldn't that be an email? Like just our habits are so different. So I didn't even look in Slack. So it's been sitting there for two days and... Yeah, I That's wasn't right. expecting that to be used in that way, if that makes sense. Slack to me was a conversation, yeah. instant message, kind of almost like MSN Messenger was for, for some people years ago. Yeah, that's exactly right. And look, these tools are great and they're very necessary to help us to collaborate more productively. But when it comes to delegating work, and, and I, I'm going to use a very broad definition here and say, look, I could be your manager and I'm formally delegating a piece of work to you. Or I could be a client and I'm requesting some information from you. Either way, I need you to do something or I need you to respond to me. My belief is we need to use direct modes of communication for that sort of work transfer. And the problem with Slack or or Microsoft Teams is they are indirect communication platforms. They're, They're great for collaboration and for building context so that we can all see what's been said about a certain piece of work. But when you need me to do something, my preference is that you send me an email or you pick up the phone and have a conversation with me or we have a meeting and you directly ask me to do that piece of work. So these are some of the the, the kind of agreements that we need to put in place so that everyone's clear about when do I use a direct communication method like email and and when is it appropriate to just put a post on Slack um, so that everyone's kind of informed that this is where we're at with that piece of work. Absolutely. And I think there's some good tips and some good lessons, I think, for all of us as we're navigating more remote remote teams and people, I guess, long term, perhaps not coming back back to offices. But looking at other kinds of workplaces, obviously, we focus very much on, on businesses in offices for the first part of this chat. But I'm thinking of things like small businesses, cafes, large institutions like public hospitals, or universities, for example. How does their improved productivity Like what does it actually look like for them? Because sometimes, you know, those organisations might be very tech lacking or they're understaffed or they're kind of just making do with what they've got. So how how would you advise those kinds of businesses? Yeah, good. A couple of different points that I'd make on that. So when it comes to those larger organisations like uh, hospitals or universities, um, we, we deal with those as clients. So there's obviously going to be a level of, worker in a hospital who is management or or back office, and they need the same productivity skills as anyone else. You know, one of the things that I've learned over the last 20 years is it doesn't matter whether I'm working with the CEO or a frontline worker, and it doesn't matter whether I'm working in a hospital or a bank, everyone's pretty much got the same productivity issues, and everyone pretty much needs the same or similar solutions. But there is a level of worker in those organizations who might be more frontline and their role is much less discretionary. So it's it's by by nature more reactive. So, you know, if I was to take it down to the small business, um, a cafe, when I walk into my local cafe, it's not so much about time management for them. It's not so much about how they organize their inboxes or their task list for the day. It's more about how they deal with the the reactive customer 
who comes in and says, I want a coffee. And it's not just one customer. They have 10 customers all at once who all want a coffee. So I think in those sort of situations, um, the sort of personal productivity training that I might do might not be as relevant. For them, it's much more about good systems and good processes. So, you know, th- th- there is a, a, a local cafe um, to my, very close to my office who are really, really good at pumping out those coffees to a consistent level of quality, even when they've got lots of people uh, ordering at the same time, because they've got really good processes in place. And the people who work there are all attuned to those processes. Whereas I go into other cafes and, and I scratch my head and think, you know, how long does it take to make a coffee? There's only two customers and yet it's just, <laughs> yes. you know, can't you do this quicker? And, and usually it's not the skill of the people involved. It's that they've got poor processes in, in place. So I, I think that that's a whole other area of productivity. And there's probably, you know, consultants out there who would, be able to come up with best practice around how you really streamline those processes and remove friction. But it's slightly different to the sort of stuff I deal with day to day. Absolutely. So personal productivity is a different area again. And of course, we need some downtime. It's not about being productive in, in all the time. We need to sleep. We need to enjoy food, family time, things like that. But I guess managing things like exercise or even just hobbies, for example, passion projects is kind of important. So you know, how does that, in your experience, work with the idea of being productive? I mean, is being unproductive actually a good thing sometimes? Mm, Absolutely. Look, um, I think that we all need to be organized. And it doesn't matter whether we are at work or we are at home. Some system has to help get stuff done. So, you know, I could give you a very simple personal example. And um, my process when I receive my phone bill is to open the envelope, look at the, the date that it's due, and then I will schedule a task into my task list. And, and I just use the one task list, I, you know, whether it's work or personal, I've got one task list, but it's a dated task list. So I've got things scheduled to do today, but I've got other things maybe loosely scheduled for tomorrow or later this week, and I've got other things for the following week and so on. So, you know, this phone bill might be due on the 27th of July. I go, great, I schedule a task for maybe the 25th of July pay phone bill, and then I put the piece of paper somewhere where I can find it easily when I go to pay that. But I've got a system in place to make sure that I don't forget to pay it. Other people in my family, I won't mention names, (laughs) Um, not, not if they still want to be speaking is, to you at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> their strategy is, and the phone bill comes in, and they look at it, and they put it on the pile of papers on the desk that has the, the magazine from Qantas and has <laughs> um, you know flyers and all sorts of stuff, and then other stuff comes in and goes on top of it. So then a month later, we get a notice to say that we're going to be disconnected because the, the phone bill hasn't been paid, and then... You know, someone will find it in the pile and go, oh, forgot about that. So it's just a a matter of having a system, um, whether it's at work or at home. It just makes life easier. But that said, I don't want to micro schedule every moment of my life. So I do not have a task list for Saturday morning, the things I need to do at home. I tend to be a lot looser around my schedule and my prioritization. But what I try to do is, is really build space into my schedule. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very keen on work-life balance. Um, I tend to you know, kind of start work at 9 o'clock. I finish before 5 most days. It's the very, very rare w- weekend that I would work. So I, I manage myself fiercely during my core working hours so that I can have an uncompressed schedule when I'm at home and I can focus on things other than work like family or relaxation. Mm, it's good advice. So most people haven't got to where they are with at least one or two mentors, people that have inspired them, helped them, guided them either in their career or their life. Do any stand out for you and why? Could I? I'm going to give you two couples. Couples? Um, That's four people. They're not, <laughs> not, not, not couples that are together right. in a, a life sense, but there's two mentors that I had early on 
and two mentors that I've had recently. The two early on were, I, I said to you that I, I kind of st- I left school, started working in a supermarket. And the first mentor was my, my first manager, who was the worst manager that I have ever worked under. Uh, he was loud, he was obnoxious, he had no people skills, terrible, terrible customer service. And I learned a lot from him, but I was only, I only realized I learned a lot when, from, uh, from him when I went to my next job. So I started working for a wine company in Dublin and my next manager, Richard, was the best manager that I've probably ever had. He, he was so passionate about what he did. He was probably one of five masters of wine in Ireland at the time, and that's the very top level of wine education. And he taught me such a, a passion around the wine industry, but great customer services. So I, you know, I really put a lot of what I do in my business today down to what I learned from him. But it was really the combination of both of them that you know taught me what not to do and what to do. So that's that stayed with me for you know 30 years or so. And then more recently, uh, probably my greatest mentors are um, two guys, uh, Matt Church and Peter Cook, who are involved in a thought leaders business school, which completely transformed how I run my practice. You know, I've been going for 20 years, but the last five or six years has been a huge period of growth for me. It's when I wrote my books and, and it was their inspiration and their belief that kind of got me down that path of really getting stuff out of my head and getting it written down in a way that increased my positioning and, and my, my expertise in the area of productivity. So if you could choose a favourite book, song or film, what would it be and why? I'm going to choose Animal Farm. And it's a little bit of an unusual choice because Animal Farm, which was an allegory that was written about the, the Russian state and, and partially the Russian Revolution, my mother used to read that to me as a bedtime story. So um, my, my brother was seven years it's old. a little bit grim. Was, <laughs> I know, I know, but it was so good. My brother was actually studying it at school and it was lying around. So she started reading it to me and it was all about animals. And, and I loved it at that level. But then I read it as a teenager and I got to understand a bit of what was behind it. And I've read it again as an adult. And it's such a, a, an amazing story. But it always stays in my mind as, um, you know, at the very simplest level, it was just a, a story about animals. Absolutely. Diff- child's uh, ears and adult ears would be very different to how we would receive yeah. something. Final takeaway message for anyone navigating the politics of productivity. So I reckon a lot of people say to me that being productive takes discipline. And yes, it does. But so does being unproductive. I reckon there's as much work involved, if not more, and as much discipline involved, if not more, in working unproductively. And it just seems to me that, you know, to invest some time and effort in redesigning how you work is only going to help you in the long run. And, you know, the sort of skills that I teach are usually skills that last a lifetime or they can, they stay relevant for a lifetime. So um, don't be scared off by this idea that I have to be really disciplined. I said to you that I, I, I wasn't a particularly productive person before I um, started working in this field. I was incredibly messy and unproductive, but I learned to be productive I fell in love with the whole idea of productivity and I reckon anyone can do it. And it's not hard when you see the benefits of that productivity. Well, that was a productivity pep talk if ever I heard one. And it has been a pleasure to chat to you, Dermot Crowley. And there will be some details on our show notes of how to make contact. And it has been awesome to chat to you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Until next time, keep well. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed The Politics of Everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber 
at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.